work on those through the machines. I'm cited for contributions to personal computers and video games. Um, the nice thing about the University of Washington, every year approximately 10,000 people get PhDs in electrical engineering and computer science. 300 people make fellow every year. And the UW engineering people think that that's more prestigious than having a PhD. So for my current career, that's my teaching credential. Was the key things. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I don't have one of these clickers, so I get to stand here and push them a lot. Okay. So what's the agenda? Why are you here? <laughs> Your spouses might think you need lives, but <laughs> never mind that. How I got here, I got to do it by designing these machines, all three of which are on exhibit in this place right now. That's an Atari 400 right there. The Atari 2600 is around that corner in the back, and the Amiga is over there in the corner. I can almost see it. It's just, I'm looking at it. Okay. So I want to talk about these, and then I want to talk about where things have gone, because all of these things have implementations right now. There's a guy downstairs with a MIST platform. I run Amiga 500 on it, he runs an Atari ST on it. Um, I've got photographs of these, and this thing is in FPGA now. They still sell these things. This is a version of that that runs cartridges. The nice thing is it has composite video and not or F on it, so I can look it up the monitors. So that's the agenda. Why are you here? Some of you are systematically here because it's called the Vintage Computer Fair, right? So you like to find and restore old machines, you like to run productivity applications, perhaps, you like to play games, duh. This is animation. Some people also write new applications. Um, I'm gonna feature a buddy of mine who has been porting the Plato term communications application to a lot of different platforms. So there's still some things to do. There are other people who write and play new games now. I'm going to mention briefly my buddy Ed Freeze who wrote Halo 2600 for that machine <laughs> not very long ago. So, how I got here. Answer. That's around the corner. That's right there, and I just lost the sound. Lost the sound. I took voice lessons. I can do it. And that machine is right over there. Probably just needs batteries. So, how about this? Okay, the key to using modern technology is not to hit the off button. <laughs> okay. Okay. One of the things I tell my students now is that the things that you spend your lifetime working on might not exist yet. So I graduated from high school 50 years ago last year. Coincidentally, that was when this guy invented video games. Now, he was working for a defense contractor called Saunders Associates in Manchester, New Hampshire, who had no clue what to do with his brown box. I went and did a pilgrimage. I met him in 2014. He died later that year. I'm really, really glad I got to see him before he died. That's he was still inventing new toys at 93 in his basement. He imagined a machine called the brown box. I actually played him on his brown box at his house. He beat me. <laughs> I wrote the Video Olympics cartridge for that machine. He's still better on his own machine. Now, his employers licensed his design to Magnavox, and it became the Odyssey, it came out in 1972. So, as luck would have it, Nolan Bushnell saw this as a demo 
He called up Al Alcorn, his chief engineer, and said, I want you to build me an arcade game based on that Pong-like game. And that became Pong. Those of you who probably heard the story that they built this first machine and they installed it at some bar in Sunnyvale, I think. And after a week, he got a call that said, it doesn't work. Went to go fix it and discovered it wouldn't work because it was full of quarters. Wouldn't take any more quarters. That's why it was broken. So <laughs> he thought, hey, we have a success here. So they basically made the arcade video game world. Pong, Drive from Odyssey. Their second hits were more complex arcade games, like Tank and like Breakout, which Wozniak designed. <clears throat> Their third hit was they took that first machine and they brought it home. They built a random logic chip and they sold it for home use. And so they're now thinking, what are we going to do next? How can we bring these more complex games for the time home? Their choices were more random logic and the other choice is to build a microprocessor-based game. Now, this is what Pong looked like. Um, I could actually demonstrate it later, but the arcade game basically was very simple. It had two scores, two rectangles that moved up and down, and a third rectangle that was the ball that moved back and forth. The direction said, don't miss ball for high score. <laughs> now, summer of 1975, I had never encountered video games before, but I'm walking down the streets in Disneyland in Anaheim with my youngest brother. I'm 24 at the time, he's 12. We find one of these, and we go, okay. So we waste a lot of quarters playing tank. Um, my brother had faster reflexes, beat me. But as luck would have it, that was very handy because later I was working in mental research and they ran out of, they had too many patients in the study with out health insurance and they ate the budget. So they gave me two months notice, I'm being laid off, right? And through my network, I found two job offers. One of them was at Atari and I aced the technical interview because I went and bought my own 6502 in September of 1975, same day that Wozniak bought his, same day that the Atari people bought theirs. So I aced a technical interview because I studied the 6502 on my own. And then they took me to the lobby. Here's a bunch of Atari coin up video games. I realized they're testing me. Do I fit the culture? So I walked over to the tank game, which I recognized. He said, you want to play tank? I said, yeah, I'd like to play tank. But I played a passable game of tank. And I was hired on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got hired to move up to Nevada City, California to debug the conceptual prototype. Ron Miller and Steve Mayer had written, built the hardware and the software for something that would sort of mock up a tank display on the home screen. And it didn't work yet, but my job was to come up there and get it to work. And I was bilingual. I understood software and I understood hardware, which turned out to be handy later because I could do hardware software trade-offs. Anyway, so I went, we got it to work in two months, management came up and, and approved it. I moved back to Nevada City to uh, Los Gatos, California, went to work for Jay Miner, the first of these three machines. And that's what the original prototype looks like. It's on display at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. And this is a picture of me many years later holding up this game that many people will look forward to on Christmas morning. We used to joke about paying to work on it. Bushnell said the best games are easy to learn and difficult to master. They were more the first quarter, they were the hundredth quarter. And there was a lot of jokes in the company about paying quarters to be able to work on things. Like, imagine that I've got a um, coffee can with a coin slot on top, and you would put quarters into it in order to keep working. Now, I wasn't married yet, I didn't have any children yet, so I could just look like a student and save money. Um, that was, as I say, luck. 
Now, <laughs> a little bit about how this machine works. Most of you are used to using machines that have a frame buffer or a character buffer. But this machine was so primitive, it had only a line buffer. So the 6502 code, with no interrupts, just playing flat out running as fast as it can. In the program flow is, there's 220 color clocks or 76 6502 memory cycles per horizontal line. And then there are 228 of lines vertically. That's the timing. So as this thing, it's time to switch displays. See this one already. I want the audio to work too. Processor is following this live. So there's a period on old classic CRTs where the electron beam is moving up from the bottom to the top of the screen. That's called vertical blank and vertical sync. So in that period, the processor is collecting user inputs from the controls, detecting and processing collisions. There's hardware that detects collisions, like if this object hits one of those things it's re-registered, and compute the new game state, including the score. It figures out a bunch of pointers into memory that it's going to use in a very tight loop, which we used to call the kernel, that it's going to run, you know, 190 some odd times, where it fetches stuff out of memory and writes it to the display, and then it, instead of having an interrupt, it toggles of something called wait for sync, which will simply freeze the processor until it's done, in which case it starts running again here. Um, the best book on that subject is called Racing the Bee. We were trying to be cheap. <laughs> Remember, this machine was first sold in 1977 had a suggested retail price of $200. In 1977, you could buy a nice house for $20,000. You could buy a nice car for $2,000. So to have a suggested retail price of $200 is like asking for two grand today. The fact that we sold 30 million units with prices like that at that time is pretty amazing in retrospect. Um, anyway, um, that's sort of how it works. It's the machine hard times out in a little over two minutes and it enters a track mode. That's why it shut up. Now, we were trying to make the machine cheap enough. It was too expensive to build a frame buffer in 1977. So we built something with a line buffer instead. The bill of materials was $65. We were trying to make it cheap so it was affordable. And what happened was, we had inadvertently put control of the vertical in the hands of the programmers themselves, who did a whole lot more than we imagined, we the hardware people imagined that they would do. If we have time, I've got a selection of cartridges that I can show. Um, but given the time, I may keep moving. Any questions before I move on? Nothing comes to mind? Okay. We did this in 76, 77, yes. Um, so, what? 
Yeah. How far beyond the combat did you think this thing was capable of doing? Well, we, during the development, I wrote the display engine for tank combat, whatnot, and it was clear that similar engines would work for great driving games and some other things. And then, sort of as an afterthought, um, between the time we got ready for production for this machine and we started working on the design of this machine, I had three months to kill. My manager said, oh, you were supposed to do a pong game. Okay, um, how many games do I have to do? And so I said, I want to make sure that I don't have to do more than 50 variations on Pong. He said, okay. Because I didn't want it to go to like a three digit game type. You know, I'll skip it too. Um, so I, that was um, Video Olympics, for those who remember. I consider a lot of them to be actually quite fun, but Foo's Pong is unplayable because it speeds up too quickly. On this mic side. Um, this is copied out of my design notebook. Where is it? Here? Oh. This is issue number two of the programmer's guide for this machine. Signed by Jane Miner, signed by Ralph Fair. And this here is copied out of this machine. So we had, we bought the microprocessor, but we threw away some of the pins. We got it a 28 pin brush, it's a 40 pin package. We got an off the shelf part where we had 1,000 bits of RAM, 128 bytes, with um, 16 bits of I.O. and a timer. And then we designed this one custom chip called the Television Interface Adapter, which does video and which does sound. And there is no memory in this machine at all. I've got a cartoon where a couple of old video games are reminiscing with each other. And the third machine, the 2600, says, I have no memory. So you plug in a cartridge, 2K or 4K bytes. Here's and modern FPGA version with a cartridge in it. So, originally, we shipped it with a pair of these and one pair of paddle controllers, which were basically potentiometers. There was a cartridge we shipped, which was a racing game, where we had a gray coat encoder, so it would rotate 360 degrees. That's this pair of controllers. And later on, a great struggle, but we built a basic interpreter and we built a couple of other things that needed a keyboard. So we came up with a pair of 12 pin, 12 button keys. You can stick them together for 24 keys, but the alphabet has 26 keys. <laughs> that was a problem. And I worked on that and I worked on that. Anyway, that's the original device. For those of you who remember having it, remember that it was fairly heavy. And you think, why was it so heavy? The circuit board was actually only this big. But what happened was marketing, trying to do something useful, went around thinking, okay, so what are customers willing to pay $200 for in the late 1970s? And the answer was, you know, top loading cassette players and things like that. And they weighed about that much. So, this machine actually had a millimeter thick aluminum casting inside around the circuit board for RFI reasons, but they deliberately made this thing out of quarter inch thick plastic because they wanted to feel heavy enough that the customers were willing to cough up $200 for it. I'm not making this up. Marketing at work. Okay, so what lessons did we learn? We put the definition of the display in the hands of the programmers who were much smarter than we were. And that meant we originally designed this machine thinking it's going to last two or three years in the market before our competition tries to eat our lunch, which they did, at least tried. Um, our conclusion was that our second system could not simply be a bitmap and a processor. So we thought, okay, we need to put things in hardware that allow the 
game designers to change the way the screen works on the fly as we went down the screen, rather than just a fixed bitmap. And like I said, we thought we needed we to move fast, so we brought this machine out 40 years ago this year. We brought this machine 42 years ago this year. Thinking that our customers wanted to eat us. Good. Okay, so, luckier. Have any of you ever read a, a book called Soul of a New Machine? I recommend it, Tracy Kidder. It's a book about the development of a new computer, mini computer, set in 1982 at digital equipment where, um, excuse me, the Data General. So digital equipment brought out the VAX, and Data General said, we need to come out with our answer to the VAX. They called it the Eagle. This is a history of the development of that machine. One of the things it talks about is basically pinball. If you do a good job of something, you might get to do it again. So I got to play pinball. I got to work on the next machine, working for the same great mentor, Jay Miner. So here we are. What are we going to do? This is our second system. How many of you ever read a book called Mythical Man Month. Wonderful book, written by the guy who managed OS 360, which was the largest software project ever attempted at that time in history. And it's got a chapter in it called Second System, where you go through and you do something, and it has to be simple because you're trying to meet, get it out the door and make some money, learn some stuff. If you make it too complicated in the front end, you probably fail and not ship it at all and not have any happy customers or otherwise. But we got something out and it worked. So now what are we going to do? You take all these ideas you've been thinking about and now which ones are you going to implement in the second system? And what we wound up doing is trying to answer the question, are we trying to build a better game console or a personal computer or both? What we ended up doing is designing one chipset and we packaged it one way as a game console that also had some keys on it and as a real computer that also played great games. Same insides. Peach? So, that's where we were and we were wrestling with that the whole time. So, at that time the FCC hadn't changed the rules yet. We were still going to do memory mapped video display because now we could afford at least four to eight K bytes of SRAM or DRAM. Use that memory in various ways. We wanted to be very flexible in what we did. The programmers had taught us that they could be very flexible with how they use 128 bytes of RAM. We thought, how could we be flexible with between four and eight K RAM bytes of RAM? Remember, this is only two years later. So we wanted to do bitmaps in monochrome or in two color. Two color means there's two bits per pixel. That means you have a choice of four different colors. And the way Atari did things was we had palette registers. So this is a four color, four different thing machine. There are four different palette registers on the screen. There are probably, there's more than a dozen in this one. There is 30 some odd in the Amiga. That's where the two bits choose the palette, not just directly encoding the color of the luminance. So, in this machine, we can go monochrome up to 320 by 192 pixels. We can do color. We looked at monochrome character sets because we wanted to support productivity application. We thought, if we're fetching that much data, we can fetch colors, characters that are themselves multicolor. I've got a slide about this later. Um, as an aside, Nintendo later had to pay a bunch of royalties to Atari for infringing on things in that machine. But no one needs to know. <laughs> That's all past. Okay. We wanted more sprite engines, okay? So these are two sprites and the missiles are sprites and there are more sprite engines in this machine. Um, provisions for horizontal and vertical scrolling, that means 
that you can not only have a fixed background, you can have an imagined, a much larger background, have your avatar in the center and slowly move everything around. The arcade people were prototyping that. Um, some of the VCS people were prototyping that. We thought that needs to be supported in hardware here. So it's time to switch. As an example of how far we had gone. So this is, those of you who remember from the arcades, this was a game called Galaxian. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on. They're moving sideways. Um, these are actually generated with colored players moving sideways, horizon, horizontally scrolled. Um, and then when one of them breaks off and flies, it's replaced by, um, it, you know, it, it's pulled out of the character map and turned into a moving object, a sprite, and then it moves seamlessly from the point of view of the user. So that's an example of what you can do easily with this machine. We wanted to, we added a simple video code processor which decides on a set of lines basis, what's going to happen? So in this one, the top line is status. So it's putting up characters, either written or fixed, telling you the status of the game. This is the gameplay. Here is, you know, different character map altogether, copyright. Here is your um, your own avatar, etc. Right. So it changes things on a set of lines basis as it goes down the screen. And then these are laid up across it. Um, this is an 800XL, which is a little bit lighter than the 800. And I chose it because it's a little bit more compact and it has a monitor up, which the 800 does, but the forward does not. And the 600XL doesn't either. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, this is Doug Neubauer, one of the chip designers, one of the surviving chip designers. He has got, let's just say he's ill. He lives in Portland, Oregon, and he doesn't grant interviews anymore. But he wrote a fantastic game called Star Raiders. And Star Raiders was so good that management decided that the 400 had to have a keyboard. So here we are. Yeah. It was so good, we put a little bit of keyboard on that one. Um, I consider it one of the best original games. There is no version of this machine in the arcades. Now, stepping back, let's suppose we want to build a personal computer. What do you need to do with a personal computer? Well, we wanted a character display because people are going to want to deal with words. So that means you need a keyboard. Provide for peripheral expansion for printers and communications, which were the most important things that you would do with words. You know, print them, pull them in from somewhere, send them somewhere else. We wanted slots like the Apple IIs and the S100s, but the FCC rules hadn't changed yet. So those of you who looked at them, that thing has got a millimeter thick aluminum casting inside of it. Protecting their RF quiet. The 800s were, are the same way. You could drive a car over them, the electronics would survive. 
So out of necessity, since we couldn't have slots, we designed a serial I.O. bus. And later Commodore copied that for talking to their peripherals for the same reasons. Um, my last patent on USB, which I started working on in the 90s, expired two years ago. Um, one nice thing that happened, some patent trolls went after the USB IF for patent infringement back in the late 90s. And the USB IF said, well, what about this Atari SIO? No patents on that. That's all public art. Therefore, we're extending those ideas so they protected themselves and the patent trolls had to go home. Yay! <laughs> In my heaven, the lawyers are bored. <laughs> There's nothing for them to do. Right, so here is a system set up for um, personal productivity. There's an exhibit downstairs where he's got a bunch of things that use stuff like this. Um, and how it would fit together is we needed the serial bus. So imagine there's a personal computer system Serial I.O. talking to, let's say, the hard drive. It has two ports on it, so you can daisy chain through them. So here's another one with a bunch of serial and parallel ports on it. Parallel port might talk to a commercial printer of the day. Serial port might talk to a modem. We talk to the modem, to the phone lines, to BBSs and whatnot, because we hadn't invented the real internet yet. But we had BBSs, right? And, of course, this thing generated video and audio to talk to speakers and monitors. Um, what the inside of it looked like, and this is in particular the original 800, had a left and right side cartridge ports. Why did we do this? We were imagining different uses for it, and one of them was, imagine somebody wants to use this for education, so they'll put a main cart in one slot, and these new carts will be subsidiary applications in some fashion that are cartridge-based. These days, RAM is cheap. You just load it from somewhere. But in those days, we were thinking about ROMs. There are slots in there for the OS, slots in there for the RAM that were underneath something that was power-locked. If you open the machine up, it forced the power off so it wouldn't radiate anything so you could change these slots. Um, there were three custom chips. Um, I worked on the system architecture and this. We used the same processor, just 50% faster. Uh, George McLeod designed this. He died three years ago, four years ago. And Doug Newbauer designed the Pokey that does keyboards, paddles, and serial I.O. We added a spare plain PIA for talking to joysticks and keyboards and whatnot. So that's the inside to this thing. I have permission from the guy who wrote this book to copy this slide. Dave Atari. So, lessons learned and not learned. So, as the game console, we had provided good self-development tools. This machine was designed to make it easy to write games for it on it. First machine of that type. Um, the book that I haven't finished would describe that in some detail. I want to port Tank to it. I want to port um, Atari Adventure to it with permission from Warren Robinette. Anybody seen uh, Ready Player One? So if you've seen it, you know the third challenge and you know what the third challenge is about adventure. In my version, your avatar stays still and the whole world moves around him or her. Um, like modern games. The guys who founded Activision, which is still in business, and the guys who founded Imagic had not yet left Atari, so Atari wasn't afraid of third-party developers yet. That became a big deal much later. As a computer, the massive cost reduction possible after the SEC changed the rules allowed us to do cost reduction, but they didn't do that for quite a while. This machine came out in either 82 or 83, three years at least after the original tank. And I don't mean tank as in driving around and shooting things, I mean as an over designed, inch, you know, millimeter thick aluminum casting machine. Commodore 64, which had lower fundamental costs, 
past Atari at this point. Um, over time, the Atari 8-bit family sold about 5 million units. This sold about 30 million units. The Atari, I'm sorry, the Commodore 64 sold 17 million units. I have a book called The Art of the Video Game, which was based on an exhibit at the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery in 2012. And the guy who put that together, it covered 40 game I'm sorry, 20 game platforms, starting with this one. But the second one was the C64, because it had that big an impact in the market and played a lot of games. All right, so Atari got passed by the C64. Um, in my opinion, to capitalize on the market, we should have built a unit with an integrated floppy disk drive so that our costs would converge on what they were for the Atari, I'm sorry, the Apple II family, which had slots to start with and came with a much lower complete system cost. And we could have, in my opinion, built an expansion unit uh, extending the bus that's available on the back of the machines, but we never got around to it. I actually got to work on a board for that, but the project was canceled in 1984. Ramel took over the system. Anyway, um, that's what we tried to, what we, the hardware designers, learned from that process. So that's an 800 XL right there. So, my last day at Atari in 1979, I had this concept for where to go from there. And that's here. I didn't make this up. So, we said, what's the next, what's the next thing we could do in the animation space? So we thought, well, things like the 68,000 will eventually be cheap enough. They were. Um, we were thinking about two port memory segments so we could do a lot of disk DMA in and out at the same time that it's running regular code. We wanted a DMA channel for communications. We want a DMA channel for the built-in hard drive or floppy drive. We wanted DMA audio channels so we can make really amazing sounding stuff. Um, we want a DMA for video and play field and sprites, moving objects. TIA3 is what later became the Agnes and the Daphne and the Porsche. Anyway, we are imagining this thing three years before we started work on the Amiga. So, I got to play pinball a third time. I reunited with Jay Miner. It was a groundbreaking animation machine. It came out in 1985. My third demo here, I'm going to set this thing up. keep talking. Okay, let's get it launched here. Notice, by the way, this is driving a monitor, but there's a lot higher resolution there than there was on these older machines. Um, it's also multicolored to start with. Let's see. It's going to take a while, but eventually it'll come up. So, here we are. <clears throat> this is a display you'll see in a few minutes. Um, 
This is one of the successors of this machine. This is Omega 1000, this is Omega 500. I don't have a 1000 yet, but maybe. Okay, it was a groundbreaking animation machine. Um, the concepts, as a game console, Dave Morse was telling us that he wanted to be able to display cartoons composed and rendered in real time. This is in 1982. He was a Vice President at Hasbro Toys, thinking games, children. Cartoon level animation, accelerate bit map manipulation in hardware, synchronized with external video. So the Amiga was designed from scratch that you could synchronize yourself with externally generated video. Like suppose you had a VHS tape or a digital camera, and you would feed it into a box and then the thing would, see this here? The display I was talking about? There you are. At some point it'll come up and give me a, 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 a choices and I'll choose one. But these things synchronized with external video. As an aside, for two decades after we introduced the Amiga, the main use of Amigas in a market dominated by Macs and PCs was in television studios. So here's your weather guy, and he's in front of a green screen, and they shoot him with the camera, and they mix that with synthetic video of the weather map that the Amiga generates, and they're mixed together with a video toaster. This was everywhere until people built PC-based commercial hardware to do the same thing. So you've seen a lot of this, you just didn't know what it was. Um, we wanted 80 color character displays. The resolutions I think you saw would have supported that. Uh, mid-80s, 1985, 1986. Okay, um, we wanted 80 column character displays. We wanted enough bitmap memory for a Xerox and Alto like Windows OS. So the minimum machine was going to be 128K bytes, you know, as in 64K, 16-bit words. But we didn't ship it that small. I think we shipped it with more. Um, so, I had seen the Xerox Alto in 1979, same time that Steve Jobs did, and later Bill Gates saw it too. But we were thinking about it at the time. Um, we wanted it to come with a built-in floppy drive rather than an add-on, or not at all. Of course, nowadays instead you just use SD, but this is 40 years later. Here's how the inside of the system worked. There's a 68,000, it's a 24-bit address bus, 16-bit data bus. Imagine there's at least 256K or 512K words of memory. And it's dual ported because this Agnes is a DMA monster. It has nearly 30 DMA channels all together. <laughs> and it can synchronize with external genlock for external video. It generates addresses, it incorporates the bit blitter, bit manipulation engine, it manages the, the video output chip feeding data from memory into this. It also manipulates stuff going into the Porsche or Paula chip, which does non-video I.O., including audio, <laughs> including serial, including disk I.O., including anything else going to the ports. So that's how this system worked. <coughs> if um, you were to think about it, the previous machine also had a chip antic that managed memory addresses in DMA, a chip that managed video I.O., and a chip that managed non-video I.O. So conceptually it was related to it. Yes? Yeah, 
in, in the, as chip prices went down, they could have chip memory and non-chip memory. In the original ones, there was only chip memory. So, this machine had bitmap manipulation in hardware. Um, one of the major contributors to the Amiga who is still living is Ron Nicholson. He worked on the Macintosh for a while. He didn't tell us what they were doing on the Macintosh, but he knew the developers of Mac OS. He knew what they were doing in software to manipulate video memory. So what we did in the Amiga is in hardware we accelerated what they did in software. So in particular, you could draw two points in some area, and then the hardware could line draw. The hardware, you could draw two more points and draw a second line. You could take that piece of memory and feed it to the glitter, which would then do area fill. So you could construct polygons as fast as the hardware could touch the memory. Um, which is why that machine can do this demo, which some of you can't see because you're way too far back. But this display, here's some fixed stuff that's not being animated, and then all of these things are basic little, little polygons that are drawn and redrawn and redrawn by the click of there very quickly. Um, I invite you to come look at it later until I have to make room for the next speaker. Um, so we did this. I spent a great deal of time between the mid-90s and the mid-90s in front of lawyers giving depositions, proving to them that we actually invented this stuff. Because there was, again, um, in my heaven, the lawyers are bored. Here, the lawyers weren't bored. But anyway, this was the first GPU. To give you an example of how this might work, imagine the bit glitter knows about four operands. Three of them are inputs, and one of them is an output. And imagine that I don't have any sprites at all, and I'm only going to do bitmap manipulation. So let's suppose I have an image of a tank, and I have the outline of the tank, and I have some random background, just multi-colored things. And I can feed that into the bit blitter, and I can set the bit blitter so that this is the multiplexer. If the bit is set, take that bit. If the bit is zero, take that bit. So basically a high-speed combiner. And the result, when you take those three operands, you get something that looks like that. And again, this moves so fast, it moves as 16 bits at a time. It moves as fast as the, the hardware can touch memory. To do this in software is at least 10 times slower. So, what do we learn from this? Coincidentally, in 1984, the video game market that was led by this machine collapsed. Um, too much crap software. Um, so Amiga pivoted. Amiga was originally going to build a monster game console as good as the Super Nintendo in 1992. But the thing was, you couldn't produce an Amiga game platform for the price of a 1992 Super NES. Because Moore's Law hadn't, you know, we still had, what, seven more years to go for memory to get cheaper and custom LSI to get cheaper and parts to get smaller. Um, so we could do what a Super NES could do, but it was ahead of its time. That's the point. Meantime, the Amiga OS was the first multimedia multitasking OS. Ten years before Windows 95 or the Mac OS, running on the power PC. But Commodore, which had bought Amiga in 1984, after I was terminated, was unable to exploit this market niche. It was widely used in arcs, like TV stations, but 
but nowhere else. So it was a niche machine. On the other hand, there are fans downstairs. So, given where we are, I have time. What happened since then? There's retro software emulation that all of you can get access to. There is retro game development going on, at least for the 2600. And there's new hardware development. So, there are emulations. Um, you can photograph these, I'll try to stay out of your way, because you can go to those places and develop new stuff. In fact, I want to hold up a book written by this guy, Steve Hub. He has a website where you can go and write 6502 assembly code against an emulated 2600 and it will show you through the web browser what it'll actually look like. This book here, it's in my list of references. If you want to develop games for this, you'll get it. Um, there are 8-bit emulators for this machine. And that's considered the best software Amiga emulator. So you can still play with these things. Modern Atari game development. So there's a, a community, AtariAge.com, that still supports a great deal of new retro games. And a buddy of mine, Ed Fries, who led the original Halo team, he designed Halo 2600. And the graphics are not near as good as the Xbox, but it's playable. You know, if you listen to Bushnell's theorem, he says, the games have to be easy to learn and difficult to master. They have to reward the first quarter, and they have to reward the hundredth quarter. That means that there's depth to them. And Halo 2600 meets that. Um, let's see. So, modern hardware. So the original machine looks like that, like this. And here is an example of the size of a flashback. Now, flashbacks one and two were field programmable data arrays. This one is. But the more modern ones are all basically emulated on an arm. The emulations run so fast that they can do everything you want and fit in something that doesn't cost very much. You can still buy the Flashback 8 today in the store. And that machine shipped 42 years ago. So, like I say, first one is the Xilinx FPGA. I'm finally going to meet Kurt Mendel in a couple of months at BCF East. Later Flashback versions are emulated. So, modern Atari computer hardware. There's two directions you can go. You can build it in field programmable gate arrays, or you can use the original chips. So there's two guys. Mark Watson is an Englishman, but he works in Switzerland, and he works with a Greek named Pano Santos. And these two guys have prototyped and shipped a small number of FPGA-based Atari 800 XL implementations. I've got a photograph on the next two slides. Meantime, some other people with too much time on their hands, <laughs> have come up with a replacement of the original 8-bit computer using original sig sig silicon, but much larger memories, built-in SD support, etc., etc. And they've got a new motherboard project. So that's where to find those guys. I didn't bring all of that with me today. This is an Eclair main board with an Altera Cyclone 5 on it. And here is the add-on board, which four controller ports, SIO, cartridge slot, interface boards. Works nice. So they posted their stuff. If you want to learn more about them, go to those places. There's a guy, an Israeli named Nir Derry. I'm hoping to meet him in a couple of months. He's got some demonstration videos. 
don't stay any way while you get that. Um, I'm going to provide these slides through fearlessly. So there should be some way that they're available in case your photographic stuff doesn't work very well. The audio broke up when you were saying where they were going to provide it. Please repeat. But the audio broke up when you were saying how the slides were going to be made available. I want to, I have copied the PDF version of the slides onto this machine. And I'll make sure that he has the PDF versions of the slides on his machine. So that they should, in some fashion, be available to the people, attendance, right? In case you're... Thank you. You're welcome. So that's uh, an SEL 1080. Not hooked up, just... All right, meantime, there's a whole lot more interest in the Amiga family in Europe than there's in the United States. Anyway, so Lotharek is his trade name. I'm not sure how to pronounce his real name. Um, has done a lot of work, and he's built mist boards. Now, there's one downstairs that's loaded with FPGA code to emulate the Atari STs. Mine at home, which is on a later slide, emulates the Amiga 500. So, and it uses SD cards for mass storage rather than floppy disks or SCSI drives, so it's a lot more stable. Anyway, um, so the little box, let's see. It's got a lot more RAM. It replaces the floppy drives and hard drives. I have to be careful of that. Okay, so for floppy, for mass storage, it uses SD slots rather than hard drives or floppies. The video is out on VGA rather than on Amiga's proprietary stuff. It has just USB port for a keyboard and a USB port for a mouse, so it supports those standards. So, front of it looks like this little box, about yay big. Uh, three buttons, three LEDs, and an SD slot. Um, reverse side is power, VGA, audio slots, and USB. The board looks like this. Here's the slot for SD. Here is the main processor, main memory. Um, not quite sure what all of these things do, but not. here's game controllers on the side. Here's a bunch of resources on this if you want to learn about them. Stay out of the way so you can take the pictures, but you can see demonstrations, you can see reviews, you can get access to the firmware, there's tutorials, you can buy them if you want. Um, under, under, under 100 bucks, I'm sure. That's my recollection, but I have to look again. Okay, so modern computer applications. Now, I've been in the personal computer industry now since the mid-70s. What do people use personal computers for? You write with them, you compute with them, you communicate with them. A lot of that functionality is end up in our smartphones. In this last week, I finally quit using my Windows phone and got an S10. My Windows phone had lasted five and a half years. Hadn't fallen into the lake and gotten ruined by the water. So, what do we use them for? We communicate with them, we talk on them, listen to them, text with them. God help us if we Twitter with them. Um, the modern machines are beasts. You know, the iPhone 10 is a hex core arm. You know, my notebook has a, an i7 in it, which is a quad core. Um, lots and lots of video display resolution, lots of communications bandwidth. I mean, we're building 
closing on a gigabit per second on Wi-Fi, and wired Ethernet is now at 10 gigabits, you take DMA to handle data at that speed, even as fast as the modern processors are. Thomas Cherry Holmes, a buddy of mine who lives in Austin, Texas, has designed a cross-platform communications thing that runs on these retro machines. It doesn't run on this. Wouldn't want to. But it does run on this, and it does run on this. So you can use it for something that's interesting, communicating with other users. He's got it running on the C64. Atari 8 bits, Atari STs, Amigas, Apple IIs, Next machines, Sinclairs, IBM PCs, 99 slash 4s, and Apple Macs so far. Plus, he's got a version that runs in your web browser. So, where do you learn more contact information? As a speaker, I always think. Well, the first thing is, what is the thing I'm talking about? If you're engineers, you want to know something about how it works. And then you might think, who cares? What's the marketing aspect of it? And if I win as a speaker, you come out of here thinking, where do I learn more? Well, I put lots of resources in there already, which you'll get access to. But I suggest a few things. MIT Press wrote a terrific book on how this thing works called Racing the Bee. It's it disappeared. What? Oh, it's up there. Okay. This one explains how it works and it explains how half a dozen of the cartridges work in some detail. My buddy Jamie Lindino, who I hope to meet a month and a half, wrote the best book I know of on the Atari 8 bits so far. I'm working on one myself, but it's lower priority than taking care of a sick wife and teaching her to go. Want to work on that? The Amiga was documented in The Future Was Here, MIT Press. Um, there's a great book for those of you who like Atari called Business is Fun by my friends Marty Goldberg and Kurt Vendel, who also run the Atari Museum online. Um, this is, in my opinion, the definitive social history of Atari at the time. The sequel, which is not quite done yet, is called Atari Corp Business is War which is about what happens after the Tremel family took over in 1984. And I hope they finish that soon. Warren Robinette, my old buddy who wrote Adventure on the 2600, is working on a book about how he wrote that game. If it finally shows up, you might grab hold of that. There's this book that I talked about making your own games for the 2600, this one here. You want to try it out in a web browser? I recommend it. Um, Day Ray Atari, which I seem to have left at home, is the definitive book about writing games for the Atari 8 bit. I wrote a series of articles about these three machines for the Atari, I'm sorry, for the IEEE Consumer Electronics Society magazine. Here's the three of them. For a handful of you, I have been passing them out. Um, there was an article on the Atari video computer system way back in March of 1983 about the design case history of this little guy. And another friend of mine wrote The Computer That Wouldn't Die way back. We, you know, the Amiga had become a cult thing in the noughties after Commodore, the company, went out of business. And I, of course, recommend the Atari History Museum from Kurt and Marty. So, here's how to find me. I respond to email. Um, if you ping me and say, um, I saw you talking today, 
and I want those articles, I can send them back to you. And I promise to respond instantly, but I would. Um, so, <laughs> I have demos. So I've been, you're demoing the Amiga right now, but you see the demos of the others here. They're all working. It is, I have 10 minutes. I can take questions for 10 minutes before the next speaker needs to set up. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, sir. Uh, let's see. He's reminding me of something important. The question is, what was the origins of the names of the chips in the Amiga? Well, beats me, there is no Alice. Lorraine was the name of the wife of Dave Morse, who was the founding um, president of what became Amiga. And what had happened, to go back, 1976, I started working for Jane Miner in March of 1976. I bicycled to work. I can't do hard software development for those machines because self-assemblers didn't exist yet. So I had to use a time-sharing service, so I had to log into a time-sharing service, so they got me a TI-700 terminal with two cassette drives, and so I could type the source code and load it onto one cassette drive, and then call up with a 300 bit per second dial up modem to this time sharing service, and download the object code on a different cassette, and then load that into the target hardware. This is how development worked in March of 1976. So I needed to come up with a password, and Jay said, no, you can't use your mother's maiden name, okay? I'm sitting there, I look around, there's my bicycle, it's named Stella, it's an obscure French brand. They had won the Tour de France with it a few years earlier, and it had a little sticker on them on the side of my bicycle. So I said, okay, it's gonna be called Stella, which is the name of the bicycle, right? Well, nobody else knew that. So Jay said, that's a great name for the, the chip, so we'll call the chip Stella. And then his boss says, that's a great name, let's call the system Stella. So Jay says, we have to come up with another name for the chip, which became the TIA, as in TIA, or as in Television Interface Adapter. Marketing looked at it and said, oh, they're naming things after women now. <laughs> so they began naming every project, everything after some woman. So, like, when this machine was developed, the original 800 was Colleen, and there was a red-headed administrative assistant named Colleen in the company. And there was another one named Candy, and they named the 400 after her. And this spread throughout Atari. And not only did it spread throughout Atari, but we had a lot of friends and frenemies at Apple. So they started doing the same thing. So the Lisa was named after Steve Jobs' daughter, and it became the product, it actually became the product name rather than simply the code name. But that went everywhere. So in general, all of them, all these things were named after either a real woman person or some name that they liked the sound of. Like Portia, as in ports. So that was named after a person that was just sort of the idea. And Daphne was originally the, data, the video data thing, so Daphne kind of rhymed with it. I think I more than answer your question, but that's where all that came from. Yeah, I, I still have that bicycle, by the way. It's hanging in my garage. Guru meditation, okay. I didn't get a chance to hang around Amiga long enough to hang out with the software designers. In fact, it was worse than that, because Jack Jamil decided to sue Jay Miner personally for patent infringement and theft of trade secrets. I was consulting for Amiga, 
And Jane Miner said, you have to become completely invisible, or Tremel will find you and sue your ass off. And I had a wife and a couple of little kids, and he could, Tremel could easily have afforded to sue my ass off. So I went underground, and I didn't get to hang out with the Amiga software developers. So they came up with the guru meditation stuff, because they were gurus. Did that answer your question? Did I repeat the question first? So they, good. Okay, I have a little bit more time. More questions? Yes, sir. I just wanted to mention that Ralph Baer's workshop is on display in the Smithsonian. Yes, I know. I've been there. I've seen it in the American History Museum, not in the, in the Art Museum. Yes. Um, I miss that guy. When I was lucky enough to be finally nominated as an IEEE fellow five years ago, six years ago, friends of mine knew Ralph Baer and recruited him to be my lead fellow sponsor because he had received already major medals from the IEEE for his justified inventions. He knew of me by reputation, not in person, but he was happy to write a recommendation to me for my contributions, and I made it the first time. Um, I miss him. More questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, to, to go back to your FCC stuff, you talked about the shielding in the Atari, the original ones were super heavy. Um, I want you to say it here. So you talked about how the uh, original Ataris had really thick shielding for FCC right. compliance. How did Apple get away with not doing that on Apple II? How Apple got away with that without doing it on the Apple II? So first of all, the personal computer business was growing in the late 1970s. At that time, the FCC rules were type 1 and type 2. So Atari would build machines that had an RF cable going to a little box on the back of your TV, and you throw it one way, then you drive the TV and you throw it the other way, then it takes something from the antenna. So if those little boxes leak, your stuff gets up into the antenna and your neighbors see it, whether they want to or not. Okay? So our limit was minus 60 dBm per megahertz. I'm sorry if that's a little obscure, but it's, it's Minus 60 dBm means a factor of 1,000 below a milliwatt per megahertz. And that's why they were in those Faraday cages. Apple and all the other personal computers were being developed independently, and all of them in principle could drive a plain monitor. So you couldn't buy an RF monitor from Apple. They didn't make one. There were parasitic organizations like MNR Enterprises that made them. So you could go to an Apple store and buy an Apple, and then an MNR Enterprises RF modulator, and the store would put them together, and that way they avoided FCC. But people started deploying these things, they made noise, it was causing interference. Eventually, the FCC noticed and implemented their class A and class B. So class B is minus 40. 3 dBm per megahertz. It's relaxed compared to what these things had to do, but the Apple II and all the others had a great deal of trouble redesigning the machines to be RF tight enough to meet minus 43 dBm per megahertz. Um, one of the things that happened, it's a true story, so while we're developing the 800, I really, really, really want slots. How, and how do I get about it? So I talked to, I saw an ad in EE Times from TI for a fiber optic receiver transmitter pair. <laughs> so I invite the sales guy over and I say, well, what I'd like to do, I, I should have made him sign an NDA. I said, I wanted to have a transmitter, fiber optic transmitter here fiber optic receiver in this little box that fits on the back of the TV. I figured that if I've got three meters, three meters of fiber optics between the box and the TV, that I can get, maybe have slots in the computer and still pass FCC because I'm isolated. And my boss's boss said, nah, that's not going to work. So we abandoned it. 
But it turns out he went back and told his friends who were designing the TI-99-4. And so they did exactly that. And they're based in Dallas, Texas, which is the home district of Jim Wright, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives at the time. So they started shipping this thing in 1979, and the SEC says, no, you can't. So TI basically had to pull the product off the market and redesign it for a year. And that was the final straw that provoked TI, I'm sorry, provoked the SEC to clamp down on all the personal computers that were exploding in the market and making the lot of radiation. And Jim Wright's lobbying the FCC didn't help that as it stiffened the FCC's back. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, with the new rules, instead of having to meet minus 60 dBm per megahertz, we can meet minus 43 dBm per megahertz. Well, that's a big factor. So the other com our competitors redesigned for the relaxed standards before we did, which means we bore those costs and manufacture longer. That is your question? Okay, I think it's showtime. I'm all done. Um, I'm going to find a place to put these later and answer questions, but get out of the way of the next speaker.